welcome to the another day of uh, webinars. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Do you see my screen? I'm not hearing anything. All right. So uh, we will start the session. We have another uh, exciting day of webinars today. Uh, we started this series as part of the annual Phytosanitary Awareness Week, which we are organizing uh, to celebrate the International Year of Plant Health in partnership with the Crop Trust FAO and the International Plant Production Convention. Uh, these webinars are hosted as part of the GeneBank platform uh, Gemplasm Health Unit. Uh, we started this series on Monday with a global plenary, and then we had a second day of uh, seminars on the Asia session, and then uh, followed by the session from colleagues from Latin America yesterday. And today we focus on uh, African um, GHU issues. Um, Africa is central to the CG program. Um, as you see in this map, they, these are the headquarters that are located at various countries. Um, you can see that Africa boasts maximum number of uh, CGR centers. Uh, it is not only the headquarters that are located here, but many of the CG centers also have the branch offices located here. And all these CG centers have crop improvement programs. Um, the key, the main ones that are located in uh, Africa as headquarters is Africa rice with a rice as a mandate crop. And then uh, ICRAF, which mainly works on trees, which is located in Nairobi. And then IATA, which with a headquarters in Nigeria and ILRI with headquarters in Addis Ababa. In addition to that, Africa also hosts ICADA Gene Bank in Morocco, uh, ICRISAT Gene Bank in uh, Niger and uh, Zimbabwe. And there are small collections of other CG centers uh, hosted in different countries, including in Nairobi. Um, one of the major challenges, as you have been hearing in all these uh, days, is a pest risk to the germplasm distribution activities. These are more significant in the African continent because uh, there are a number of quarantine pests that are prevailing here. I just listed a few of them. Uh, which many of them are actually are introduced from other continents and they are a threat for spread within Africa if sufficient care is not taken. And another risk is that some of these pests can also move out of the continent if adequate precautions are not taken when we are distributing planting material. So in, in essence, the continent is a kind of hub for most notorious quarantine pests, which pose a big challenge for the germplasm exchange activities. And also another risk is that the region is typified with a weak phytosanitary capacity. As you can see in this map, which was a study done in 2016, which estimated the phytosanitary capacities across the world uh, as a proactive and reactive approaches to contain invasive pests. And many of the African countries are red in, when it comes to the proactive capacity that is to prevent pest occurrence incidences and also for reactive capacities. It is somewhat better, but still uh, it's less than optimum. So in this situation, GHUs are operating. The CG GHUs are enabling the distribution of uh, biological resources from uh, the CGR centers. What you see in this map is the location of GHUs in the headquarter CGR programs. So these programs enable distribution of both seed crops, clonal crops, um, and the tree germplasm. In today's presentation, we have a exciting list of uh, speakers. We start the session with the keynote by the, the director of the Africa Union Inter-African Phytosanitary Council. This is a regional plant production body 
that looks at the broader policies and uh, implications across the continent and also the voice for the continent in the IPPC and the intergovernmental panels. So Dr. Jean Girard has kindly agreed uh, to deliver this um, keynote address as the first, followed by presentation from uh, the Dr. Mary Noel. She is a uh, head of Gene Bank as well as in charge head of Germplasm Health Unit from Africa Rise. And then Dr. Sebastian, who's the head of Germplasm Health of uh, Alliance Biodiversity Seattle. And he is, uh, he is basically based in uh, University of League, Belgium. Uh, he talks about uh, the Musa germplasm health and followed by presentation, dual presentation by Dr. Alice and uh, Jane Juguna. They talk about the tree health in the continent. And then um, Alemayo from uh, Ilri, who is the in charge head of germplasm health, talk about the forage seed health. And then last, I talk about the phytosanitary issues of the food crop germplasm from the basically talking about IATA uh, crops. And then the director of plant quarantine, Dr. Mr. Obaji John, would speak about the relationship between the CJR and the quarantine organization, because this partnership is vital to move um, to undertake any activities when it comes to germplasm distribution, because it is the national programs which holds the key and permission card to permit bioresource exchange. So this partnership is vital and um, we are here for more than 50 years and Mr. Obaja will be sharing some of their experiences working with CG centers. And finally, uh, Dr. Michael Aberton will provide the closing remarks. Michael, Michael Aberton is the head of Generic Resource Center and also deputy director for research uh, for West Africa Hub. Um, he is also the focal point for the GeneBank platform for IATA as well as the excellence in breeding. Uh, so with that brief introduction, I will invite um, the first speaker of today, Dr. Jean Girard. Uh, I will ask our uh, IT team to open his um, video link so that he can share his screen and also microphone. Thank you, Radha Kumar. Uh, uh, tell me, I will share the screen. Uh, no, no, can I go to the presentation first? Uh, no, yeah, either way, it's fine. Okay, it's okay. Okay, let me go to the share screen. It's okay. You double click it. And then you can click here. Yeah. Can you go to presentation mode? Where is the first screen? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. It's okay. Hello, Lava. Yeah, yeah. You can you can go to the presentation mode. Yeah. Okay. You put here. You can you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I will put uh, on the big uh, big screen. Yes, please. If you have a challenge, I can I can load slides from this end. You can also share your presentation. No, okay. okay. You can see me? Can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for everybody. We are. Although it is not I'm, in the presentation uh, mode, but I think yeah. we will. I'm presenting. Uh, I'm, we, Africa Union, Inter Africa Phytotherapy Council is very happy to join this meeting today for Africa. African uh, time for to present our um, concern about, about uh, the item for this meeting. Uh, as you can see, uh, my name is uh, Jean Gérard Mesjumela. I am an AU uh, representative, permanent representative in Yaoundé and also director of the AU IAPS, Inter African Phytosanitary Council. 
Uh, you know, everybody knows that uh, 2020 is an uh, international year of Plan S, and uh, our uh, big activity is uh, to share, to, uh, to uh, recognize this uh, big event for Africa, despite the COVID, uh, <laughs> COVID pandemic. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, overview, I will, uh, I will, tell, I will uh, begin with a small introduction. We will focus also in regional value chain in agricultural commodities and the process for fraud products. We will go also for continental mechanism linked to agricultural development. The experience in the regional free trade areas in impacting agriculture, agricultural risks, health care concern, emergency phytosanitary risk, initiative related to biological, biological risk, other initiative and conclusion. For the introduction, uh, you can see the, um, the logo for African Union and uh, the logo for Inter-African Phytosanitary Concept. The African Union Assembly decided in 2012 during this uh, in ordinary session to boost intra-African trade and to fast track the continental free trade area. Uh, the African continental free trade is expected to boost intra-African trade expansion, stimulate sustainable economic growth, and foster inclusive development. It will be contribute to meeting African 2063 vision and also help Africa to make progress in implementing the 2030 agenda and sustainable development goals. However, the world and more specifically the African region, African region face several threats from a number of plant and animal pests and disease that occur an epidemics or are endemic across national borders. They do not only adversely affect agricultural productivity, but also contribute to poverty and hunger, particularly of smaller holder agricultural production and all as barrier to trade. Over the past several years, research and has gained in insight into the biological nature, nature and epidemiology of pests, but they remain all used gaps and understanding and implementing strategies to manage these pests. So further research is needed to strengthen this area. The regional mechanism linked to agricultural development, many regional frameworks exist in a region coordination in agriculture and development in Africa. In 20, 2003, member states of the African Union committed to the Maputo Declaration, the pledge to engage 10% of their national budgets to agriculture and reach a 6% annual agriculture growth by 28. The Comprehensive Agriculture and Development Program CADAP was created. It is a program of the new partnership for African development Nepal, and it is provide a vehicle for implementing the Maputo commitment through country or need and agricultural development programs involving multiple stakeholders. The African trade further area is a place with its annex seven on SPS issues, which would include liberalizing trade and agriculture and commodities. The visionary and policy documents set the sense for the underlying focus the influence of the influence and African or African trade, African trade, free trade area on the development of agriculture in Africa. The regional value chains in agriculture, commodities, and processed food products. In 2014, was observed at the International Year of Family Farmer Farming by the UN, 
It is also celebrated as the year of agriculture and food security by the African Union. Agriculture has been highlighted has an effective means to fight poverty. The focus of a regional value chain in agriculture communities and proceeds for products comes at cross world between different focus of the development community positively impacting the role of agriculture in the African economy. For the regional organizations such as the Inter-African Photocentry Council, the acronym is IAPS, it is the opportunity to emphasize the central role of agriculture in Africa's economic growth. The regional free trade area impacting agriculture Interregional trade flows among African countries remain low between 6 and 12 percent when narrowing the focus on the sub Saharan African agriculture market figures amount from 1 or 2, 6, 1 to 6 percent. The experience again by Comesa, East Africa community, SADEC, is particularly interesting. They set up a tripartite free trade agreement, which could prepare, could prepare the way for an Afri for Africa-wide elimination of trade barriers. Six agriculture represent a large share of the three ranks. The experience can be of particular relevance to assess the impact of regional free trade areas and agricultural commodities and proceed goods with the objective of the scaling is up to the continental level. Agriculture, agricultural risks, they, they, they include waste risk, climate change, food security, nutrition and vulnerability, the input risks, marketing, logistic and infrastructure risks, marketing risks, public policy and institutional risks, biological and environmental risks such as crop pests and disease. When we talk about plan as key concern for Africa, the International Fiduciary Conference held 2016 held in Kenya identifies six key concerns of plan issues in the continent among them uh, among them are outdated member state plan protection and legislation and regulation. Frequent new outbreak of pests and disease in Africa, inadequate phytosanitary information and knowledge sharing for farmers, no capacities for disease surveillance, diagnosis, appropriate inspection, and a reporting system of poor facilities equipment and logistics to scientifically prove issues concern plan S. Lack of a common African platform to developing for developing pest diagnostics and risk assessment and capabilities. Inadequate human resources to create a rapid response team for dealing with emergency situation lack for lack for animal, locust attack, and the vector spread. Uh, in a cause of viability and function as a result of pest and disease outbreaks and trade facilitation through the harmonization of participatory measures by developing the globally agreed standard providing mechanism to resolving phytosanitary disputes, disputes and ensuring scientific basis for the establishment of phytosanitary measures. Other initiatives, the IAPS and the efforts to continue implementation of its 10-year strategy plan 2014-2023 there have been dissemination of the IPPC annual plan through organizing a series of advocacy activities, establishment of a new 
oversight body for implementation and capacity development and the permitting of IPPC strategy planning for 20 and 2030. The IPPC secretary is also continuously improving its performance through increased engagement and collaboration nationally, regionally, and globally. In 2020, it is the International Year of the Plan S, which activity has been implemented by the COVID-19 pandemic. However, some activities have taken place. In conclusion, uh, please, it is our hope that the recommendation of this webinar meeting will help the policy makers, IRD manager and regulatory official to take appropriate decision and put effective system in place, including strengthening regional cooperation to minimize the establishment and the, and the prayer of pests in the continent that impact agriculture, market access, and trade. Thank you very much for uh, your kind attention and uh, you can uh, excuse me for my English. Thank you very much. Asante, obrigado, and uh, merci beaucoup. It is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gingerard. Thanks a lot for your excellent uh, keynote and then nicely highlighting the mission of uh, Inter-African Phytosanitary Council and some of the challenges that the continent has and then the opportunities um, through various IAPSC activities to strengthen the phytosanitary capacity. We also appreciate uh, acknowledgement to the CGR programs. Um, in raising awareness about phytosanitary matters and uh, the close working relationship that we have with you, with your organization. So thank you very much. In the interest of time, we will take questions towards the end. We move to the next presentation. Uh, this is to be delivered by Dr. Mary Noel. She's the head of uh, Africa Rice Gene Bank and in charge head of Gemplasm Health Program at Africa Rice. She will talk about uh, bioproduction of rice gemplasm. Uh, you can share your screen. Okay. Uh, For now, I cannot. You, please, can, can you uh, my, uh, my screen, please? Yeah, can you please uh, stop sharing your screen? It's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mary Noel, please go ahead. And you may like to introduce your uh, new, new pathologist who just came in. Okay. Um... He can turn on the camera to show his face. <clears throat> you see this uh, share screen option? I took it, but now I'm trying, okay. Oh, it is coming. Yeah. Okay, now it is on. No, sorry. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, where is the presentation? Can you see the screen? Yes, but your, okay. it is not your presentation. We see your folder. You see my folder? Yeah. I put the presentation on the screen. What is going on? Wow. There is a presentation. Maybe you need to open your. Uh, I uh, share the screen here, but I don't know why it's not working. Okay. Is a. Uh... Do you want to come later on? I will ask. Uh... Sebastian, if he's ready to present in your place. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. Uh, they are stuck. 
Wow, what is that? I don't know. Do you have too many windows open? Maybe you can close uh, your multiple windows. Okay. So I don't know what is uh, why it's not working. I don't know. They this has stopped. Eh? Oui, il a mis. Ils ont mis et puis. Okay, so what I suggest is while you while you start your uh, okay, I see something happening now. Okay, we we can see your screen now. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see me? Yes. Start my my video. Huh? Okay. Go ahead. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, sorry for these uh, high tech things. Eh? <laughs> we always take time to, to make a lot of tests, but uh, when we start the presentation, we are not, uh, we, we face other challenges. So, um, uh, before I start my presentation, my name is Marine Wenjonjok. I'm heading the Rice Biodiversity Center for Africa. But before I start the presentation, I will I would like to introduce Dr. Onaga Joffre, who is uh, the head of uh, pathologies and the seed health uh, unit at Africa Rice, who joined uh, the center uh, uh, recently. So I want to give him the floor to introduce himself before I make the presentation. So Dr. Onaga, you have the floor. Cannot hear. I don't know what is going on. Hmm. Actually, one thing. Huh? Please, you go ahead. We will introduce towards the end. Okay, okay. Because I can't hear him. So... Okay, now um, it's okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think the host had muted me, so... I was ah, trying to it was mute. okay. Good. So, my name is Geoffrey Onaga. I'm a new pathologist for Africa Rised. I just joined recently. I'm happy to be here. I know some of you may, may be knowing me or not, but it's a great pleasure to join you. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. so I was asked directly to make the presentation on the, I changed the title of my presentation, as you can see. I will present on the monitoring of seed herd of rice gem plasma for conservation and international transfer. So uh, this presentation has been prepared by uh, Onaga, Fatimata, Uridis, and Bernardin, who are all working with at Africa Rice. Oh, I cannot move the slide. I don't... Okay, so because touch we on. are, yeah, you now touch you on can... the screen and then. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know, for no, those who don't know Africa Rice, it's uh, one of the CG centers like uh, 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 Lava just presented. We are based, our headquarters is in Cote d'Ivoire in the, the 
administrative office is based in Abidjan and the research office is based in Bouake, in Bay, 30 kilometers from Bouake. We are also in Nigeria, we are also based in Madagascar, we are also based in Liberia and in Senegal where we have a regional office. So uh, we are CG Center, but we are also association of uh, 28 member countries. Uh, so our mandate is RISE. So I would like first to give some general information on RISE and also on the Gene Bank that will help you to see really what the, the seed herd are doing in terms of work in, in collaboration with uh, the Gene Bank. Rice is uh, one of the staple food, important staple food in many African countries. It's the third in terms of uh, total global production after maize and wheat in Africa. It belongs to the genus Oriza, where we have 27 species, and in which eight are found in Africa. Africa is also the only continent where we have the two cultivated rice species. We call them Oriza glaberima and Oriza batai. What is the history of the domestication of rice in Africa? Africa rice and Asia rice have been shown to be independently domesticated from the wild ancestor Batai in Africa and Rufibogon in Asia. The, the domestication of Africa rice was first uh, was identified in the, in the upper inland, inland delta of the upper Niger River, today called Mali, about 2,000 or 3,000 years ago. The species then spread out in two secondary centers in the Gambia and Casamance, uh, in Senegal and Guinea-Bissau, and also in Guinea forest between Sierra Leone and Cote d'Ivoire. This African rice called Oriza glaberima, you have a picture here, is uh, it's very good in terms of a reservoir of several uh, genes that uh, for um, of the genes that um, gene of resistance to several biotic and abiotic stresses, but also have some weaknesses like loading, grain shattering. Here you have uh, one picture of uh, when the plant load. And uh, so they have uh, high, low yield and also uh, some strong dormancy. Asia rice was introduced in Africa by European uh, in, when they arrived in the continent. And uh, this was done in Africa by the Portuguese in the middle 16th of the 16th century. Africa rice had been replaced by the introduced A Asian rice in most part of the continent, although some West African farmers still grow the African rice. Uh, Asian rice has a high yield, but is susceptible to most of the constraints that we found in Africa. Therefore, there is a very important need for breeding. This is why we have a breeding program. The goal is to combine those uh, 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 important traits that we have in the African rice and the uh, uh, Asian rice to develop high yielding varieties with uh, 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 good grain uh, quality and adapted to local conditions. So you see that um, in the gene bank, we have all these resources, the, 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 the glaberima, the Asian rice are also the improved cultivar. What are the main activities of the brain gene bank? We have routine activities and we also have research activities. In the routine activities, we mainly have uh, 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 those routine activities are main because uh, our performance target, we are evaluated annually uh, to see the performance of the, uh, our performance based on these six, uh, five indicators, the gem plasma availability. It means that our collection has to be clean, viable, and have enough seed uh, for distribution to, to user. And also in terms of security of the collection, 90% of the collection have to be secure in two locations. We have to have uh, the collection with uh, good quality data so that the user can use them to choose the, the, the own material. We have, to, we, have, we have to put in place a minimum element for the quality management system. Or uh, some uh, center have the ISO. And, and then the last criteria, may, very important where the, the GI2 also intervene a lot is the distribution in terms of diversity, in terms of quantity of seed that we distribute. So we're conserving 21,000 accession at Africa Rice. 
where on which 82% are, are, are in the long-term storage and uh, we 76 for now are safety duplicated in two places in Svalba and for Collins. So we have these storages, the long, uh, the MTS and also the LTS where we are conserving. What is the composition of the, our collection? We have the two cultivated rice species, improve, improve uh, uh, rice cultivar developed by the breeder and, and other, other partner and then the wild species. So we are distributing the material. And then, you know, for exchange, the, uh, we are distributing the material. I just want to show you how much in, importance and the, the quantity of material that we have been distributing since 1995 up to 2019. We distributed uh, those number of, uh, were very slow in 2003 because of the war. We had to move from Cote d'Ivoire to Mali and then to Benin and reach the maximum in 2013. We distribute mainly in Africa country and uh, mostly in Africa. And also when we have requests for in Europe and United States, we also respond to those requests. As you know, there are two centers in the world working, men, two main centers uh, working on rice in the CG at least. You have IRI in the Philippines and we have a strategy for distribution. So we distribute only the material which are, which are originated from Africa. And when the demand comes from Asia, if we don't have the, then IRI will respond to that demand. So these are the countries that we were able to reach. And uh, our user are now CGI, University, Advanced Research Institute, NGOs, and the farm organizations. So, you know, when you, you develop, you have, you conserve those rice, uh, 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 rice has uh, a lot of enemy in the rice cultivation. We found those uh, enemies, some of them are, are seed borne pathogen. So you have uh, in the field, you have wheat, you have pest, and also we have various bacteria, fungus, and also nematodes, which are seed bone. Therefore, when you transfer, when you distribute, or when you receive the material, those are the, the pathogens that can be, create the problem. Um, so we have a seed inspection procedure when we acquire the material for incoming seed. We have our quarantine laboratory and seed health laboratory where we receive the material and we check them. To, to make sure that the material that we will introduce uh, will be clean. And we compare also, we, we, when they are clean, we grow them into the, our quarantine screen houses. And then we have a series of uh, seed health testing activity that we perform in our lab. In terms of seed health activities, we do what is the seed disinfection and also the seed plating the seed incubation and or for pathogen identification, if any. So we have, then I would like to show also the workflow of the seed treatment uh, activity prior to distribution. So when we receive, when we receive a request from the user, we, uh, of course, we have a import permit, we have all the information, regarding uh, the instruction, how the, the, the material should be treated before we distribute it. So we look to, at the material against the pathogen by doing this protocol that we are here. These are routine activities that we have in place here. Then we treat again the insect using this specific product. Then uh, for the disease, we have this uh, product that we are using also. To, uh, which are very efficient for, for most of the, the, the disease, um, seed borne uh, pathogen. And uh, then when the material are clean, then we can then distribute them to our user using uh, regular documents. We bring into the laboratory will be clean of, uh, of, uh, of diseases for conservation purpose. So we have all these steps that we have to follow. We look at uh, also the treatment for the nematode because we have those, these nematodes in the field. Then we also have the, the clean the field during the establishment of the, 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 the field establishment. And during also the growing of the plant, we look at the 
all the of, uh, weed. And uh, during the growing stage, we also have uh, some uh, uh, activities uh, related to the management of the insect pest. So the seed health unit, the actually the visit the inspect the field where we grow the material from the from the field establishment up to the uh, 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 reproductive stage to make sure that there is no disease there's no emerging disease or the insect uh, in the field so to make sure that they they treat all this material before the harvesting So this is uh, one of, you can look at one of the, the fields that uh, were, uh, uh, were treated and how the field look like now. So this year we were able to, to analyze uh, more than 2,500 uh, uh, accession or sample. In terms of sample, your accession were analyzed. More than 4,000 sample were tested among which uh, uh, the to these are the total reaction that we had, we were able to do in 2020. We, yeah, we also did the inspection because we also have the material import, in material import and also in the field. So we have uh, uh, the GR2 group will do the inspection during the growing of the plant, either in the, in the plot or in the field, to make sure that the plant are growing, the plant which are growing are healthy. So they follow this protocol, and these are the results you can see: the healthy plant here, and also in the pot here, and also in the field here. So this year, more than five thousand rice accession have been uh, inspected by the GR2 team, and to make sure that. Uh, the material which are growing in the field are healthy. So we work uh, also um, a lot in, uh, with our national plant protection officer. They are based in Abidjan. We strengthened our collaboration with them. They were able to visit our center for discussion and uh, they visit also the facilities to see how we are working. And, uh, and uh, uh, they agree that uh, because we are in Bay, which is like uh, more than 400 kilometers from Abidjan, where they are based. And uh, so we were able to um, strengthen our collaboration so that they can visit us most of the time and facilitate the transfer, international or regional transfer of the, of the material, which are clean of uh, all the quarantine diseases. So this uh, uh, slide is just to illustrate uh, the, the visit of the NPPO from Côte d'Ivoire, who is based in Abidjan. So in this slide also I'm showing uh, some results of the work that we did this year uh, in terms of uh, distribution of uh, material that uh, we, from the gene bank and also for breeding, the breeding program, uh, the export and also what we acquire. Uh, in the in the gene bank and also in the breeding program. Here, I would like to share with you some work done by Madame Fatimata, where she was able to use uh, the leaf sample of moringa and also the seed of moringa to reduce uh, the infection of uh, bacteria uh, which have infected uh, the seed. So, based on the on the, the, you can, I can see in this graph, can see that uh, she was able to use uh, uh, the Moringa leaf sample or the Moringa seed to uh, inhibit the growing of the bacteria which were actually uh, infected, uh, um, present in the seed, rice seed. So this is just to show that uh, there are some um, biological, uh, uh, means that we can, tools that we can use, natural tools that we can use to, to control some uh, uh, seed-borne uh, pathogen. Here also, this is the work done by Pegalepo Esther, where she was able to use uh, black pepper or, or 
black pepper, also red pepper, to increase the, uh, to reduce the infestation of the insect in the rice conserved uh, by the farmer. You can see that after three months of conservation, there is a very high effect of, uh, because the, 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 the powder can kill the pepper or the black powder can kill most of the insect after three months of conservation at this uh, concentration. And uh, when you keep up to six months or so, you have uh, this level of, uh, of uh, you can keep the sample up to six months, but it's really efficient at uh, three months. So the, these are the, the, the tools that the farmer can use in the, in the farm to conserve the, the, the dry seed in the, in the house. Okay, uh, with that, I would like to acknowledge people who did the work um, at Africa Rice and also acknowledge uh, the, the funding support that we got from the CGI Gene Bank and from the Crop Trust. And I cannot end this uh, presentation without saying a big thank you to Lava Kuma, who is leading this group and who is uh, really supporting us to do all this work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Mary Noel. Excellent presentation. Uh, we take any questions towards the end. Um, <clears throat> in the interest of time, we move on to the uh, next presenter. This is presentation to be um, given by Dr. Sebastian from Bioversity. He's going to talk about monitoring banana germplasm health for international transfers. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Lava. Thank you, Sebastian. Share my screen, my screen. Here it is. Do you see my screen properly? Yes, we okay. can. Perfect, great. So I will explain a little bit what we are doing now on uh, monitoring the health of banana germplasm for all the international transfer uh, from the Gene Bank of Biodiversity uh, International. So um, what about the, the worldwide banana production? You know it's uh, in this uh, belt of banana production in a tropical and subtropical area. In fact, I am located in Belgium, here in Europe, as I'm also mentioned it in, a, in a, the map of, presented by Lava. In fact, in Belgium, we have absolutely no banana production. So why, I am, why, why are we located? Why a germplasm health unit in Belgium? In fact, we have no banana production. We have a mild temperate climate, which doesn't suit uh, this crop. Uh, in fact, it is a great asset to limit phytosanitary risk. Indeed, if you look um, based on the clima climate of Belgium, we have no risk of germ germplasm contamination from the environment. We have no pest of banana here in Belgium. And in addition, uh, we have a limited risk of banana pest introduction and installation in Belgium. Uh, the banana pests could not be able to survive in the uh, ecological conditions in Belgium. So all of these, in fact, uh, is our work. Uh, in fact, we do not need to have quarantine facilities. We have quarantine facilities in the laboratory, but we don't use them for the banana work. And the germplasm importation is easier. Uh, our NPPO uh, has very low requests regarding the importation of banana uh, sample. Uh, we are uh, an area free of any major pests like BBTV or Fusarium tropical race 4 in Belgium. And also in Belgium, we are not alone because uh, close to the GHU, there is the International Musa Germplasm Transit Center, uh, which holds the uh, biggest diversity of banana accession uh, from 30 years ago. And they, they are distributing the, this accession all over the world. And we, our location close to them is also the transfer of plants between the gene bank and the GHU to make the testing or the therapy. And also to finish presenting uh, what we are, wh who we are. In fact, we, have, we are a laboratory within a university, the University of Liège. 
and the laboratory is carrying out three main activities. We are making service, the GHU services, but also other services of diagnostic and detection. And at the same time, we are doing research and we are teaching to master and PhD students. And I will show you through one or two examples how this interplay between the research, the service, and the teaching activity can create synergies to improve continuously the germplasm health. What are, in fact, our activities in terms of uh, service? We are doing what is called pre-indexing. I will come back to it later on. We are doing the virus indexing of the banana plant to ensure that uh, to test for uh, any virus present potentially infecting banana. We are also making the therapy to clean the accession that have been detected uh, with a virus. All, all of this to uh, promote the safe exchange. Uh, just for information, we have, for example, summarized what we have uh, obtained, the, res the result obtained and the trends that we have seen in the infection of banana germplasm by viruses in uh, the publication published uh, a few years ago. If you think about safe uh, exchange of uh, clean germplasm, uh, we have two main focus in mind, first bacteria and fungi. Uh, in fact, there is a protocol of in vitro transfer from the field or greenhouse plant to the in vitro culture, which has been set up 20 years ago at the uh, ITC center. So the gene bank hosted by the uh, University of Leuven. And it allows the elimination of microorganisms, therefore reducing dramatically the risk of uh, in other uh, regions. Uh, the problem is higher for viruses that are much more complicated because, in fact, they can contaminate and it's pretty difficult to eliminate them easily. Anyway, for the indexing that we are doing in our germplasm health unit, we have to use the greenhouse. The banana plants from the in vitro tubes are grown during at least six months in the greenhouse and with at least four plants per accession. These four plants are tested. We are making a symptom observation at three and six months. In addition, we are doing a targeted molecular biology test. Uh, I would say we target the big five, which, which are the, main, the five main viruses for uh, banana uh, plants. And this RT-PCR method allows us to have a very good sensitivity, even low amount of these viruses could be detected. Uh, and the analysis of molecular biology is done at three and six months. And it's important because we have observed throughout the year that sometimes a plant can be detected positive at three months, but not at six months, depending on the physiology uh, of the banana plant and also on the uh, virus, which can be um, heterogeneously distributed in the plant. And in addition, to be sure that there is no other viruses, we make electron microscopy at three and six months. And it allows us to, to observe any viral particle without what I call a priori, we don't target it. So in, in fact, at this current stage, we have uh, the safest and more complete indexing for MUSA germplasm health with a battery of tests at three and six months. So that's the service that we are carrying out uh, currently. But what is interesting and what I wanted to share with you is this interplay between the research and the service that is carried out. One main focus of our work has been to speed it up, uh, how we can have a rapid evaluation of the viral status of an accession. So if we look at the traditional, um, the traditional way of working, we have a sample is received, usually corn tissue from a collecting mission is received at the gene bank. There is an in vitro multiplication, an indexing of the clone. And after that, you know, with six months in greenhouse, we have the results, which means that originally you need around one to 1.5 years to have a complete indexing of the plant. What has been done, in fact, we have speeded, speeded up the, this process first by doing what is called a pre-indexing on a single plant. And there, uh, the process allows to have the results in six months, which means 50% gain in terms of time for uh, accession um, evaluation. 
And what we have done recently, also thanks to the support of the Crop Trust, we have developed a testing directly on the corn tissue. This means we will analyze this tissue that is received. Part of the tissue will go for the in vitro culture and we analyze another part of this tissue. And we can have the results in one or even more, less or more a month. So very quickly, it's a huge gain in terms of rapidity of evaluation. Nevertheless, the diagnostic test on a single plan here or on the corm here is less reliable than complete indexing. Indeed, we have a risk of false negative. And in fact, here are, for example, some results that we have observed. It's based on the pre-indexing of 474 samples. What we have seen is that uh, nearly two, well, more than two thirds of the sample are infected by at least one of the virus, which means no virus is detected only for one third of the plants. This brings and this shows the usefulness to have a short and quick evaluation, allowing for the majority of the sample to uh, quickly act. And what do we do in fact? If an accession is positive with this pre-indexing, we put them directly to the therapy. You don't have to wait one or one and a half year. No, you can go put, put it quickly to therapy. And on the, other, and on the other hand, the negative accession would still go for full indexing. And it's one third of them because we want to be sure that there is no other virus as the reliability of the pre-indexing is a bit lower than the full indexing. So again, we want to quickly uh, have a quick screening test, which is not perfect, but which uh, allows us to, to save time and uh, resources. Um, another example of this uh, interplay between uh, research and um, service is that in fact, I explained you, we have several tests once we do the indexing and sometimes we observe viral particles on the microscope. So there is a virus in the accession, but we have no positive for the PCR test. So the, it, it raises a question of, is there a new virus or a new strain of a known virus that we could miss with RT-PCR? And I give you an example of uh, a new virus that has been identified from this discrepancy. In fact, uh, we observe viral particle, but no PCR, and we sequence the uh, RNA of the accession at high throughput, generating millions of sequence, which allowed us to identify the new virus infecting banana plants. We launched an international collaboration with John Thomas and Cathy Crew from Brisbane University. And at this stage, we identified 10 whole genome of this new virus. And having several genomes allowed us to develop a diagnostic test by RT-PCR. And what we have done, uh, we have checked on the accession undergoing indexing in our facilities, are they also or not infected by this new ampelovirus? And the good news so far is that uh, on the uh, bit more than 100 accession, no other has been detected positive so far. And so these results, we will uh, publish them soon. And it's an example of how our process allows to continuously improve the germplasm health. Another example is thinking about new targets. Uh, and there, there's not a detection, discovery done in the laboratory, but publication, uh, res, recent publication uh, in the last decade, uh, stating that it seems uh, there is a wild disease linked with cytoplasma, at least in Papua New, New, New Guinea, and recently detected from India. Uh, and in that case, we have evaluated uh, existing PCR protocol for the detection of cytoplasma, and we have uh, evaluated, validated one of them internally. And now what we are also doing, also thanks to the support of the Crop Trust, is this uh, screening of accession undergoing indexing. Are there or not infected by cytoplasma? So far, no other detection uh, was, um, was observed. And finally, a fourth example on how continuously we try to improve the germplasm health is the integration of new techniques. In that, that case, it's a te a technique, technique, technologies called high throughput sequencing. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we, we wrote uh, an opinion paper on the future impact and future direction of high throughput sequencing for plant virus diagnostics. And in fact, if you look on the current indexing protocol, we have a very sensitive tool on five viruses, low level are detected. And we have uh, electron microscopy to detect any virus, but with a lower analytical sensitivity. 
uh, electron microscopy is not so good to detect few viral particles. And in fact, the high throughput sequencing could combine the sensitivity of the PCR with the uh, inclusiveness of electron microscopy. So we could detect any virus on a very sensitive way. And currently, in the frame of a cross CGIR center with SIP, ITA, and SIAT, we are working on the validation of these technologies for, again, improving the germplasm health of our collection. So in conclusion, uh, we, I showed you, well, we are in a banana non-producing region, but it is a pest-free country, which uh, holds some advantages. Uh, we, the, the services that are uh, carried out are also done in synergy with the university and with the research done in the laboratory. Uh, we adopt a stringent indexing protocol to ensure this highest five citizenry status. And I tried also to make some exa exa example on the interplay of service and research in order to speeding up the test, to expand uh, the test range to new threats, and to adopt innovative tests, again, with the same goal of uh, highest phytosanitary health. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sebastian, for this excellent presentation. Uh, you very nicely highlighted some of the emerging challenges to the banana uh, health indexing and then the new developments in uh, detecting viruses in particular. And also you highlighted the risk of emerging phytoplasma issues where um, two countries have already reported diseases caused by phytoplasma in banana. Uh, it's quite interesting the approach uh, you have taken in reducing the time to ascertain the health status, which is a big challenge for uh, health testing of clonal crops because it often takes six to uh, six months to two years. So excellent progress, thanks a lot. Uh, we will move on to the next presentation. Uh, we'll change gears and move to trees now. Uh, this is going to be delivered by um, Alice, who is the head of uh, Gene Bank and in charge head of Gemplasm Health at uh, World Agroforestry Center, and she'll be doing this together with uh, Jane Nuzuguna, who is the uh, Deputy Director for Kenyan Forest Research Institute. So please go ahead and share your screen and make presentation. We can see you. Okay. Let me get to share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Is it in full? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good, good afternoon and good morning. I hope it's still morning in West Africa and welcome to the presentation. Thank you, Rava, for organizing all the these get together on GHU. So I'll give a brief presentation on the gene bank perspective to germplasm health and what we are doing. And then my colleague, uh, Jane Dr. Jane Juguna, will proceed specifically addressing the issues and the challenges on the tree diseases and pests. So as Lava has introduced, we have the ECRAFT, uh, ECRAFT as one of the CGIL centers and its mandate is working on trees uh, research and both on farm and on the forest. And right now we changed the name from ECRAF. We are now called C4 ECRAF after alliances with the C4. Uh, we, ha we have a seed bank, a gene bank, which has two portions. The seed bank located in Nairobi, where we hold the seed collection of 189 tree species. Most of the collection is from Africa. And then we also have a, the field gene banks located in 42 sites across 16 countries where we hold our 43 species and these are across ECRAF working regions, but a quite good significant uh, number of these, about 70%, uh, again, they are also from Africa. And uh, the most interesting thing with our collection is also that we hold most of the indigenous, uh, indigenous species from these regions. And we also distribute most of this material to directly to the users as they are 
Uh, I'll just highlight a few activities of the gene bank for those who may not be well acquainted with what happens in the gene bank. Gene banks, yes, they are for conservation, uh, not preservation. It is conservation and it's conservation for years. So we revolve all our, all our activities revolve around use to ensure that the material that we have is good enough for distribution. So we store it for future use and for the current use, as you can see with all the activities shown on that slide. A recent introduction, of course, is you see the GHU as I'm going to give in the next slide. So our work involved distribution and we distribute over 500 seed samples and a sample can contain many seeds. So in, in average, we always estimate we are distributing over a million seeds per year. And then in the regional nurseries where we have our focal points, we also distribute seed seedlings. And that makes a quite big number that we are distributing maybe over 2 million seedlings per year. And therefore it means if you are go not going to do to distribute clean and healthy material, it means that then we are we can be transmitting or we can be liable of uh, cause exchanging a lot of unhealthy germplasm. The other thing which is relevant to germplasm health is that we also guide our client on the tree selection because tree, different trees are. Uh, can grow to different uh, regions. And the other thing you also guide them is on the management because we always say trees, all trees have that potential of becoming invasive. So they have to manage them so that they do not become invasive. They are, even the ones we call invasive tree species, they are important, but they can only be managed to, for the people to realize the potential that they have. So we, another role of the gene bank is that we provide information on such uh, types of the species that are invasive. So we've been working all along with our partners across various regions, especially in Kenya, we've been working with Kefri on the seed testing and health testing. But recently, we also established Ajamplasm Health to ensure that we have all the, we continue doing this faster. And uh, we have a great lady there, Sheila and Phoebe, who are undertaking that initial establishment. Is just started uh, testing our initial samples, and they are very happy about that. So the, this GHU or the germplasm unit will be responsible for health testing and cleaning any material, as well as issuing health statement for the seed to be conserved. They'll also be responsible for disease and pest monitoring in the field gene banks, as well as the nurseries, and we. Also also hold a post quarantine monitoring unit because we the, the GRU the genetic resource unit is responsible for acquisition of material for other aircraft projects and sometimes we get material moving from one country to another and once it is approved by the NPPO that is the CAFIS for, uh, then we hold it in that post entry quarantine and it is also that one will also be at the germplasm health a bigger role for them, which GHU is linking to the gene bank, of course, is to ensure that we are adhering to the International Phytosanitary uh, Convention guidelines in, in, that involve germplasm exchange, acquisition of phytosanitary certificates, and ensuring that we, of course, we get timely plant import permits so that our exchange is not delayed uh, as a result of that. So while working with the tree germplasm, we have a few challenges that maybe uh, um, my colleague uh, Jane will also expound on this is that we have some of the challenges we have is that we deal with an with uncertified tree germplasm which where mainly there is an exchange from farmer to farmer and if not farmer to farmer the material is sourced from the nurseries and most of these nursery three nurseries they are unlicensed and that means that they will not be controlled and this is something that we've observed across Africa it's not just in Kenya but across Africa we have this type of challenge then again there is also limited pathogen information dealing with the hundred and of a 93 species, 193 species. There's very little information known about these pathogens. And of course, there are others that are still emerging. So there's a lot of work to be done. Then there are within the national authorities that are responsible for surveillance and also for testing, there is also limited resources. Therefore, they also may not be have the information on these pathogens. Much more is on the illegal transfer of germplasm, especially within the polar borders, because not many people will 
really no, it's maybe out of ignorance that transferring germplasm, three germplasm from one region to the other is a criminal offense, but they normally do that. You tell me a lot of it, germplasm will go under without it being recognized. Then we also have the cross, uh, cross three species infection. My colleagues who are pathologists tell me there are likelihood that one pathogen will be from one tree to the other. So it's of course contrary when it's moving from one tree to the other, it becomes also a challenge. And then again, tree health is not a big issue to many people or to even the funding, also to, also to, to, the, to the maybe in research, because you find that they, and looking at a tree even when it is diseased, the pain they feel when they look at a maze is not the same way they look at the tree. They, are, they assume maybe the tree will have a natural way of evolving itself, but of course we need to take interest in that. You'll find that the, now the most interest that is there is on economically important tree species, like especially the traded fruit trees, tree species and also things like coffee and cocoa. But indigenous species like the ones we are having, not many concern will be there. And of course, the other challenge will be distribution of vegetative material, the seeds, the cutting and science, and pathologists will tell you why this is a challenge. They are not as easy to clean as the seeds. And of course, we have uh, pathogens being carried over with the food, the, fr the fruits and the fresh, uh, the vegetables, they are going to harbor the pest. And when you throw them away, trees being perennial, if there was any pathogen, they are likely to be carried over to the next, uh, within the tree, and then they will proliferate over there. So I just got this slide to show the impact, and I know Jane will dwell more on that, that Indeed, things have not been lost for three species. You can see what has transpired from 1885 to 2014. We have cumulative in increase on the non-pest, non-native pest and diseases. Trees are being introduced. I mean, pests and diseases are being introduced both in the natural forest as well as in the planted forest across Africa. And of course, this is not so rosy because it means that we are going to end up losing the material. So a, a brief on what is the major impact on tree diseases. Our concern on tree diseases and uh, tree and pest uh, on tree, uh, the impact is that trees have a long generation cycle. For a tree to produce a fruit, some of them take as long as seven or six years. So if a tree is attacked and dies after the seven years, you can imagine the resources that have been invested in it that will be lost. And again, that farmer, that land, the loss of livelihood on all the things that they had committed there. And that's why we need to protect them before they become, of, of course, attacked and reduced to zero. Of course, they'll be reduced. In, if they don't die, there is reduction in the production which of course will affect the livelihoods. And again, also trees being perennial, and some of them are evergreen, meaning that they are going to have these pests and diseases for long, and they will be the reservoir for transferring them maybe to other species. Uh, I think the only way we can, uh, people understand about three diseases is when they look at, as, as, as I've said, across the value chain, the impact of what would have happened, what has, would have happened, uh, let's say, into a avocado. Because when you have, uh, like, this is a big market in Kenya where we uh, export a lot of um, avocados across Europe. So if you find that the market, the, there is rejection of the avocados because of diseases or because of use of pesticides, that is the time people start thinking, oh, there is a disease here that needs to be controlled or looked into. Or if it's something like cocoa or coffee, yeah, that is how disease and the pests that they will be felt indeed that they are there. So how have we been working on tree health? We've been working with partnerships across Africa. The Germplasm Health Unit in a, at headquarters here and in our regions, we receive a lot of inquiries on tree health. And these inquiries, mainly, of course, from the field gene banks where we have across the, the various regions. So we may not have the answer to all these, 
but we partner with our national research institutes to who address this because most of these national research institutes have their pathologists, uh, uh, plant pathologists, who will assist us to address these queries. We are closely working with all these countries, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Marawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Cameroon, Nigeria, all of them in addressing tree health. And now what we, the main area where we have really concentrated on is in capacity development in terms of techniques also, and also in germplasm health testing protocols. And of course, in networking, especially on emerging tree health, I mean, tree germplasm health issues, both on pests and diseases. And from here, my colleague Jean will pick up and she'll be able to present the other aspects on tree germplasm and health. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Alice. Um, I hope Jane can share her screen and then she can uh, run a bit faster. We are running behind time. Yeah, Jane, please speak. Jane, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Please share your yeah, please screen. Please share your screen. I want to share my screen. Uh, Hello. You just press this share screen button. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes, it's coming up. You can okay. go to the first slide. Yes. Um, I'm trying to get the... Yes, this is a collaboration between uh, Kef Kefri and Ikrat that uh, we've been working together. And I was I was uh, addressing the issue of protecting African tree jamplazine from invasive uh, by native and uh, biotic uh, threats. Uh, a little history here, this is the tree seed collection in Kenya of indigenous tree species started in the 1880s with a few key species, that is, uh, it coincides with the, the, the early explorers or colonialists. And up to 1920, uh, in the 1920s, we have organized forestry plantation development. And up to by, by 1936, we only had a few kilos or the collection of a few kilos of tree seeds just to meet the few plantations that were, that were being uh, established. As of now, we have a target and we are working towards uh, providing 54 metric tree tons from, the, from 150 tree species to meet the requirements of the 10% tree cover. Kefri hosts the only tree, national tree seed center in the country, which was established in 1985. And the main times of uh, tree jamblasm, it is important for, for us, I know you are all familiar with it, or most of you. We have seeds, seedlings, uh, tissue culture materials, cuttings, grafts, wildings, and markets. And we note that uh, tree jamblasm is mainly moved around the world through wind, air, transport, road, animals, soil. And uh, these same methods are the same ones that are used for pathogen dissemination. And here we see the various types of uh, tree germplasm that we, we use. And I've tried as much as possible to show you the indigenous tree species that we are working on. We have the seeds and the seedlings of many of see the tissue culture, the grafts from our indigenous tree species, the Vitex keniensis. And our species, our two species last year, that is uh, Osiris tansilata and Euphobia tanaensis, these are threatened. And so we are propagating them from cuttings and markets. And uh, uh, just to let you know that we only have about five trees in the wild of Euphobia tanaensis, so we are trying to multiply it. Uh, Alice has said that the forest is different from what uh, we are talking about. Forest is very, very long term. And seven years to act to me as a forester is a short time. 
90% of forestry development depends on tree seeds. And forestry has two types, that is the orthodox, the simple seeds that can be stored, dried and stored, and the unorthodox seeds that require, that lose viability easily, and therefore need uh, some special treatments. We also note that uh, because the forestry depends on 90% tree seed, it is also the, easy to know that it's also the main pathway in which disease and pathogens will be disseminated globally. And of course, uh, as pathologists, you know the pathogens either are internally seed-borne, externally, or as surface contaminants. Why African tree jump plasm? We note that um, the African continent has varied for forest types with various uh, unique, with unique, unique vegetation. The African region is a biodiversity hotspot and it hosts a, a good number of uh, UNESCO biosphere reserves. And within East Africa, we have uh, some endemic tree species. And a study that was uh, done in 2017 showed that Mount Kilimanjaro harbors the world's tallest tree. Uh, you can see the name there, belonging to the family Molesi. Uh, surprisingly or coincidentally, we've been working on other species, indigenous species of uh, molecule of Melia vocensi, which you can see at the, the, the extreme right. And this is an, a one, one and a half year old seedling planted in the drylands of Kenya from our improved materials. Now, the invasive uh, biotic pests or exotic pests mainly include fungi, bacteria, viruses, virus like organisms, phytoplasmas, in insects, nematode birds, animals, and man at the end of it. We always have man there. But in forestry, we find that fungi are the most economically important, causing serious losses throughout the tree value chain, and Alice has talked about it. I'm just going to show you six examples of exotic pathogens attacking exotic tree species. And what we need to note is, is that uh, in the East African region, on the farms, like in the Kenyan landscape, you find that the landscape is dominated by three or four species on the farms and another three, four species at the plantation level. And anything happening to any of the species uh, leaves the, the landscape vulnerable. The first case, uh, classic case we have is the Dodistoma blight or Pinus radiata and Pinus patula. It appeared in 1956 and then 1960s. And up to date, we do not have plantations of pinus radiata in the country, except what you see at the right is a plantation that is in a very unique place called Timau in Mount, uh, Mount Kenya. This material we imported from uh, New Zealand, but it has not been able to establish anywhere else. That plantation exists on its own and uh, we think is an outlier. The second disease is a ceridium canker on the cypresses. Initially, it was attacking Cupressus maculata, but with the time it has reappeared in the, in the last five years, this pathogen has reappeared and is actually causing deaths on various uh, cypress species, not just the, the original maculata that it was attacking. We have another fungus that has a, that attacking um, eucalyptus. And this is a, it has just proved that uh, this fungus came from South Africa and we trace it to the, the time when we, the East African region imported lots of clones from, from there. So we, we have a situation whereby we have an invasion of several uh, fungal pathogens. The fourth one still is on the Botosferia canker on eucalyptus clones. You can see the, the clones are on, on the right. And uh, on, on the right, you have the same disease on eucalyptus clones. I want to inform you that before we imported the clones, we did not have serious problem, health problems with our, our land races that, were, that existed here for more than 100 years. The, uh, the fifth pathogen is the Latosferia canker of steel of eucalyptus clones, which was traced from uh, the, according to sequencing and the studies that are done in Kenya, the spread was, uh, was traced from South Africa through colonial materials in 2019. Now, the other one is a uh, Gravidia is also an exotic species and it has of late become very susceptible to the still the Brotosferis complex of diseases. And uh, this, this species is very popular within the East African region. 
And this particular fungus is becoming serious and especially on off-site planting of grevillea. Now, the, in terms of protecting the, the trees, we know that movement of germplasm is a risk number one and is the most serious. And Alice has said, we have many unlicensed tree nurseries. In fact, in Kenya, we don't have what we call uh, certified tree nurseries because of the lack of the protocols. But in the last few years, we have established a tree seed certification, certification unit. And this year, we are starting tree, tree nursery certification unit in collaboration with the, the CAFIS. The roadside tree nurseries are our main problem. And uh, because there's free movement of people and people buy, you cannot uh, trace where they are going. In terms of the pathways, how these pathways are introduced into the, the, into the various places, the same model that uh, are introduced in Europe also worked here. And uh, the, the, main, the main source of risk is through living plants, uh, the soil and the seeds form apart. Cutting, yes, and the, the 17% is also a big area because we do not know, so these are unknown tree, uh, known sources of introduced pathogens. Why do we protect our jamplasm? We note that uh, non-native pests and pathogens are a threat to both indigenous and exotic tree species. And what we have seen is that the, the exotic tree species are more susceptible to these pa pathogens. The, there is a theory or the knowledge that uh, the local indigenous tree species have adapted well with the environment and therefore are able to absorb the, the short-term shocks of the climates and the climate fluctuations. The, this has been uh, shown very well by the canker pathogens, which have become in, increasingly important on exotic eucalypts and have little impact on indigenous eucalypts, that is the genus Cisigium and another species. There, we have also seen that ex exotic tree species are more susceptible to the complexities of the diseases that come in through hybridization. And I've said earlier, we have just a few tree species, uh, exotic tree species, which we are depending on. And therefore, we feel that it is important for us to protect our indigenous tree species because they are, they are able to tolerate the diseases that are in the environment. And we have uh, a few, uh, some research work to prove that our indigenous tree species are, are good. And uh, we, we are not saying that in the exotic tree species are bad per se but they, they can also be adapted. In fact, most people think that um, the genus eucalypts is natural to the East African, to the East African region, but we know that some have really adapted well, that the eucalyptus camandulensis is, is, has adapted well and is resistant to a, a good number of these canker pathogens. However, we also note that uh, species site matching, which uh, uh, Alice talked about, is key for these species to to survive. And what's better than having indigenous tree species that are suited to the environment? We also note that uh, few pathogens are host specific and therefore this, the risk of the exotic pathogens hybridizing. And this is, uh, has been proved to be true from the group of pathogens that, is, that fall within the botrosphericy. Then uh, the other thing why we need to protect our germplasm is because the African germplasm is little studied. There's not much information about it, except the cultural values of the medicinal plant uses among very many tree species. It is also known that protection is hindered by inadequate information. The protocols and procedures for certification, which our collaboration with WeCraft and other international institutions, we are working hard towards developing these procedures and protocols to certify tree, native tree germplasm. The chances for exotic tree germplasm, uh, yes, so in terms of uh, protection, we, see, we look at the governance of tree germplasm in Kenya, and it's basically governed under the Seeds and Plant Varieties Act and the Plant Protection Act. And those two are basically on agricultural crops. We, we note that these tree seeds are unique and complex, and they're not adequately covered under these two uh, acts. And therefore, as an institution, we have gone ahead to, to develop a, a, a tree seed regulation uh, to 
work on the forestry seeds. We are, this, uh, the regulations have gone far. They, we have developed and they are now at the public participation uh, stage, which is key in the constitution of Kenya that everything must go through public participation. It is important for us to create awareness on the importance of using healthy jump dressing because forestry is a long-term investment. At year seven, year eight, somebody has waited. And if they lose the material at that point, we find that it is uh, frustrating and we have seen some most people meet their early dates. It is important also for us to enforce phytosanitary measures. We know that uh, is, this is usually done at the, cross, as border, the borders between the countries. But in, internally, in between the countries, there's so much material that is moving from one region to another one. You find that a disease can, be, can occur at the coast and find itself at the, at the other end of Uganda within a day just by internal movements at the, at the borders of Kenya. It's also important to enhance the enforcement of seed testing using the applicable laws. Kefri is a member of the OECD Forest Seed and Plant Scheme, and we are working hard towards ensuring that only healthy germplasm is exchanged, especially with, it, with the push to achieving 10% recover and the massive seed production and exchange that is happening at the moment. We note that Kenya plant health Kefis works mainly at the borders. And we feel that CAFIS should be facilitated or work towards inf uh, infrastructure that also work within the local government, the where the cess is collected. We can also have uh, enhancement of these uh, phytosanitary measures within the, the county borders. In terms of fast tracking uh, protected tree germplasm, also we need to fast track the approvals of the tree seed regulations once we have gone go through the public participation. Kefri has gone ahead, they are just working on the tree seed regulation as already to be, to be ready. We are working towards expanding the tree seed certification unit. We've been doing that we, in connection with, with ICRA. Our facilities are not well expanded, but we are happy that the government of Kenya has given a commitment for us to establish a tree seed certification unit based at the Kefri Mubuga. And also, it's a carefree, it's a, it's ISO certified. We also Im, implore other institutions to ensure that uh, healthy germplasm is exchanged within the countries. Regular monitoring. There are cases where in this country and also beyond where some uh, problems have gone unnoticed for too long and have ended up as an epidemic simply because either there, is no, there are no uh, staff to, to monitor or there are no resources. Capacity of uh, building of education and research institutions. Someone did mention that the use of the students and the PhDs to bring up this, this information is, is important so that we get a booklet or an, a, a, a compendium of protocols. I've said that uh, CAFRI is implementing the National Tree Seed Production Strategy and we, we, in that and the tree breed, breeding strategy, both are aimed at collecting, processing and distributing quality germplasm aimed at ac accessing healthy jumpers for the 10% recovery. cover. We, between Carefree and Nicraft, we are continuing to develop the protocols for a few selected tree species. And of course, joint resourcing for all these activities is critical to ensuring that uh, African tree jumpers is protected from pests and diseases to ensure ecosystem integrity and resilience. For that, I thank you very much, uh, you, uh, the whole group, for allowing a national institutions to be part of this debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chiguna, for this excellent presentation. Uh, some nice recommendations and great developments, great developments with regard to the focus on seed health. I think uh, this is a very neglected area in the continent. Um, therefore, uh, the developments that are being undertaken jointly by Ikraf and uh, Kefri deserves a, a special applause. So I hope you will keep up with this work. Um, we are running almost uh, 15, 20 minutes behind the schedule. I request participants to be patient because these are very important presentations. Next talk is going to be delivered by uh, Alemayo. Uh, it's a, another important area, 4-H um, germplasm health, which, which is again a, a neglected area. So let's listen to um, Alamayo. Alamayo is from uh, Ilri. He's the in charge head of germplasm health. 
at Ilri based in uh, Addis Ababa. Hello, everyone. Uh, can we can you hear, hear you. Me? Yep. Okay. Can you see my screen as well? It's coming up. Not yet. Okay. Yep. It's coming now, yeah? Yes. Okay, good, mo good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alamayu, I'm from Elri. I'm, uh, I'm in charge of the, or coordinating the GHU uh, Elri activity. I'm, uh, so as you can see, uh, I will be presenting forage seed health protection. Uh, and in my presentation, I follow this content. I will introduce you some of uh, the gene bank information. And then I will touch why forage seed health is important and then see how seed health management we, we're doing. And then I will see, or, or I will present also Ellery GHU facility workflow in the meters. And I will then go to seed testing and uh, some of the challenges in the future perspective in our, in our GHU team. So to start with uh, the introduction, Ellery Gene Bank Hold is one of the most diverse collection of forages. And these forage guards are grasses, legumes, and forage water trees. And we have over 18, 19,000 accessions from over 1,000 species in our, in our gene bank. Uh, we have four uh, uh, sites of uh, gene banks where we produce different kinds of forages. And these four sites has got uh, different uh, agroecologies suitable for production of different forage uh, crops, which could be tropical or subtropical materials. And this makes uh, Ilri Gene Bank one of the unique uh, gene bank which which is able to produce different forage from uh, tropical and subtropical origins. And, uh, and with this information or background, uh, I, I would like to share with you why forage seed health is very important. First of all, seed health uh, affects the gene bank operations. And uh, this, when I say gene bank operations, we have to regenerate, conserve and distribute uh, seeds. And if you don't manage properly, if you don't use good quality seeds, especially with, in terms of health, and you might lose the, the, the investment you made throughout the year. So it's, it's very important to have uh, seed health. And also it causes uh, yield losses. For example, in main crops, is, it has been documented, we could lose for, for approximately 40% of yields due to diseases. And this is also not different for forages. In forage, we could use uh, a very large uh, quantity of yield due to disease. For example, in native grass, it has been documented uh, uh, over up to 90% of yield could be caused by a single disease, which is called, caused by phytoplasma. And, uh, and this phytoplasma could, could affect the farmer's uh, uh, forage resource and also their income at the end of the day. Besides the direct uh, impact in terms of affecting gene bank operation for us and also yield for the farmers and the producers, it could has also an indirect effect in terms of uh, harboring uh, or uh, acting as an alternative force for the different pathogens, which could uh, spread, spread to the next uh, crops adjacent to the, the forages. And besides this one, at the global level, it, 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 it also affects the uh, sustainable development goals in terms of env environmental protection, in terms of food, in terms of health, and also uh, prosperity. And when we talk about seed health management, where we, we are talking about the value chain, value chain of seed production, which is very similar to uh, main crops. So when we, when we produce, uh, healthy seed, we have to start from field management, which, which is starting with healthy seed and keeping the, the field clean and the hygiene, and also use of integrated approach to enhance plant health. And after production under field condition, we have to make sure we process and dry the seed under optimal condition, which reduces the contamination of seed 
during harvesting, processing, and the cleaning. And then once we process and clean, we need to package and store at appropriate, uh, under appropriate condition. Especially we have to monitor the moisture content in order to reduce the, 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 the uh, disease infestation. And, those, and also we have to use appropriate packing materials, which will reduce uh, 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 disease infestation or uh, contamination. So what is the role of GHU in, in the seed uh, value chain of forages? So our, our role is to make sure we regenerate, conserve and distribute healthy seeds from the gene banks. Especially when we talk uh, distribution, uh, farmers uh, need high quality year round feed and the forages for their animals. And if we are distributing, uh, if we're not distributing healthy seed or clean seed, they, they will be affected and also the, that will implicate it in the social economic development as well as livelihood of the communities. And that's why seed health is very important. And here in Hillary, uh, we have a germ plasma health unit, uh, which has been established uh, almost uh, three years ago. And it is one of the key units in the gene bank uh, and uh, feed and the forage development program. So we have, uh, we, we do seed testing in the cold rooms. And in the cold room, we have over 80,000 samples from over 90 accessions. And we have also thousands of light plants under field condition in the, the four sites. So these, uh, and, and to do this one, we have uh, labs and the facilities. We have established mycology lab, uh, virology lab dealing with fungi and uh, viruses res respectively. Recently, we have also established ba bacteriology lab where we have uh, to test the seed for bacteria. And we have also molecular diagnostic labs where we do uh, the different uh, molecular tests, especially PCR and RT-PCR and also LAMP. Besides these uh, traditional labs, we have also biosafety level two labs and the greenhouse, which support this, uh, the gene bank operation in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, doing more testes, which will give us more capability to do different diagnostic tests in, in, in a contained environment. And in terms of pathogen detection, we do uh, detect fungi using basically microscopic uh, detection level right now. We also test viruses. Uh, right now we use a uh, dot plot and also Elasia for detecting the different viruses. We have also started recently bacterial detection. Uh, especially we consider the three bacterials, pseudonymous, antonymous, and cursobacterium. And, uh, and whenever we go to greenhouses and also this, we also inspect the plant for pests and the vectors, which uh, with, uh, some of these are epid strips and the petals. And with this, I go to the workflow. Uh, the, our workflow is we collect samples, which could be seed or leaves, either, either from the cold room or the field gym bank. And we, we use different methods to detect the, the, the for example, the, for bacteria. Currently, we base on morphological uh, colony characteristic. We are also optimizing PCR conditions. We use microscopic method for fungi and DOT or ELISA uh, technique for viruses. We, we, we document the data. And once we document the data, we give GHU decision to the gene bank so that they can take the necessary measures either to, to go ahead with, uh, with conservation and packing and uh, saving in the, in, the, in the cold room or maintaining the plant under field conditions and action will be taken depends on the decision we made. And so far in 2020, we have tested uh, uh, over 3,000 samples for fungi and also over 1,300 1, samples from cold rooms. And we've got uh, like 58% of the seeds free from fungi and 60% of the, the plant is free from viruses. And we also tested sample from field where we advise our regeneration team to make action so that they remove the plant infected with viruses. And so far we tested over 2000 uh, samples from I think over 
1,800 accessions, and, and we give the data and they take measures by removing the plants, the infected plants, and also by improving management practice to keep the plants or the field healthy or uh, keep the plant free from the viruses. So the challenges we have is uh, we, we have major diseases uh, which affect our production, uh, seed regeneration and conservation. Particularly from fungi, we have Fusarium alternaria, the top two uh, fungi problems. We have poti viruses and alpha alpha mosaic viruses from viruses. And also we have vectors like aphid and trips, which are affecting our plants, especially in greenhouses. And the other challenge is uh, plant health uh, or disease management under field condition. And for this, we start using broad spectrum agrochemicals. And also we try to increase the field hygienic or the storage drying and processing conditions so that we can reduce the level of contamination in our plants or on our seeds. And uh, in the future, we are also planning to introduce seed treatments using chemicals so that we can treat some of the diseases before we distribute uh, the seeds. And currently what we use for detections are lab-based because as I said, we have four sites. We produce this in different sites in, in this four site and we bring the samples for detection in the lab condition. And this requires setting up a lab with expensive equipment and the process is very slow and laborious. So the idea is we need to have, a, a, we need to optimize our procedure so that it is more quicker and, uh, and uh, less time taking. And for this, we need to optimize multiplexing detection method based on uh, PCR or RT-PCR or isothermal amplification. And this uh, leads to the quest for next generation diagnostic and which, which doesn't need high quality DNA, RNA or cDNA synthesis or protein extraction, which doesn't need probably PCR machine or cyclic amplification and gel electrophoresis and gel documentation. So when we say next generation diagnostic, it has to be very quick and simple, robust and a real-time detection approach, which facilitates the detection and uh, uh, det detection of the pathogen and also facilitates the uh, uh, measurement which has to be taken under field conditions. So when we say uh, this, it's, it, we need some procedures. We need to optimize a procedure which could use crude extract and then do the next generation diagnostic, and then uh, you detect the pathogen. For this one, we need to have a simple extraction method for either protein or DNA or RNA. And then we need to have a technique, this next generation diagnostic technique, which is low cost, a quick, like I said, simple, portable and high throughput for detecting the pathogen. And some of this could, could have been applied everywhere, uh, somewhere else, which can be, uh, uh, which can be applied here also, like isothermal amplification, minor ion sequencing, coupled with uh, a quick sequencing uh, kits. So when we say this kind of uh, procedure, it has to be it has to be applied at point of care. And uh, let's say if it is possible to optimize a technique which is equipment free, and if it is possible to apply techniques which can be used at room temperature. If not, which can be solar power, solar or battery or PCR powered, and it has to be non or non destructive methods as well. So if we can optimize this one, we can we can we can elevate the problem of time taking procedures, which has to be done under lab con laboratory conditions. So the other perspective is like in forage. Uh, research has been not done like in many uh, main crops. So we need to we need to enhance the research on forage seed health, and so far there is little information on the pathogen of many uh, uh, wild forage species, species in our gene bank, and this needs further research. And especially we have to do the research because uh, there will be a risk of introducing pathogens to a new area, or, uh, or which will be uh, which will affect uh, the distribution of seeds. And who knows, there is a lot of issues now with pandemics. Probably there will be a potential pandemic pathogens of plant origin in the, in the near future. And so we, need, we know there are some unknowns which we know, and we know there are some unknowns which we don't know. So 
uh, needs further research also. And there is an opportunity, especially using modern molecular tools to discover and document some of these pathogens we, we don't know. I think with this, I would like to thank uh, my team. Uh, and I'm, I'm very fortunate to be with a very energetic team which has been established during the last two years. I'm very grateful to the Gene Bank team as well as the uh, uh, Feed and the Poly Develop prog Program in, in, our, uh, in our program. And we will also like to, or I would like to thank also the Ellery management for their support because they give a lot of uh, support to make our test on a daily basis and also the Gene Bank platform. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Back to you, Laba. Thank you. Thank you, Almayo. Excellent presentation. Um, I mean, I'm glad to see so many changes um, to support the 4 gm plasm health. The new improvements are very encouraging, and I hope you will continue to keep up with this work. Mm -hmm. Now uh, we are running a bit late, so please, I request participants to hold on. Um, uh, one more presentation and then a few remarks, closing remarks from our key collaborator and our gene bank head. Um, we will try to finish in 20 minutes time, uh, hopefully. So I will start my presentation. Let me share my screen. Can you, okay. I hope you can see my screen. Yep. Okay. So um, I, it is my turn now to talk about the procedures for phytosanitary safety of uh, food crop germplasm um, and then the green pass concept. So I probably can skip a lot of background, but just to give a brief background about IATA, just like uh, the previous speakers uh, mentioned, IATA is also a CGR center uh, with six mandated crops. They are all very important food staples in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. These are maize, soybean, coffee, cassava, yam, musa, that is banana and plantain. Uh, IAT headquarters is located in uh, Ibadan and uh, it has several stations and hubs spread across nearly uh, 30 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, as you can see in this map. Uh, IAT hosts the largest food crop genetic resource center in Sub-Saharan Africa, the uh, IAT gene bank, which is located in the headquarters the nice building behind the tree that you see is the Genetic Resource Center, which is now getting a, a second floor on the top. Uh, the uniqueness of uh, IATA mandate is it, it has a mix of both seed crops and the clonal crops. So there are six crops, three of them are seed-based, and then three are clonally propagated. Um, IAT exchanges bioresources. What are these major viruses that we exchange? Now, the first one is seed, seed of copy, soybean, maize, and uh, several wild vigna and miscellaneous legumes. And uh, vegetative propagules, ITA exchange vegetative propagules of yam, cassava, and musa. This includes stem cuttings, tubers, suckers, tissue culture plants. Some of these material exchanges are limited to the, the domestic situation, not all planting material are distributed, all forms of planting material are distributed internationally. Uh, I would mention in a while. Um, and then there are a number of programs which are involved in bioresource exchange. It is not only just gene bank. IT has very vibrant crop breeding program and they exchange all the mandate crops that I have mentioned. Uh, and then there are seed system projects which operate in multiple countries and they also move material between the countries. Um, and the biocontrol projects there are bioresources. In addition to germplasm, there are other types of uh, biological products that are distributed by IIT. That includes biological products such as Aflasafe, um, Nodomax, which is a rhizobia in Auckland for legume, uh, legume, and then insects, which are used for biocontrol as a predators. So all these material are internationally exchanged following the proper procedure. And also, IIT also support exchange of bioresources of other CG centers that are hosted within IIT, example, Ilri and Africa Rise, which are in a Ibadan campus. And this is something which is common. Uh, just as an example, 
this is a very active program. This bioresources exchange is a very active program just from uh, Ibadan station alone. I just provided the data of 2018 and 2019. Uh, altogether, at an average, about 120 exchanges happen every year, uh, reaching up to 52 to 70 countries. And as you can see, this distribution happens almost all parts of the continent. And you already know, I mean, the challenges of intercontinental distribution of any biological material, there are issues to be careful with. And the major concerns have always been with the pests. And uh, there are regulations. There are leg regulations which strictly govern the movement of planting material. And one of the strict requirement is the health considerations of the material that is being moved. And these are enforced by the, the national plant production organizations. Uh, using the IPPC framework, ISP, International Standard for Phytosanitary Measures, and other national protocols. And um, when the distributions happen, one thing that we need to be very careful is that every country, without any exception, hosts pests that are perceived as invasive threat for other countries. So this map shows uh, how many invasive, I mean, these are all the, this is a map of native pests, but these are the native pests that were perceived as invasive risks to other countries. As you can see, uh, Latin America, for example, many of the native pests in Latin America are perceived as invasive threat to other parts of Africa. So this is a risk. So there is nothing like uh, we can, uh, we are okay with one particular pathogen, but uh, we can be relaxed with the other one. So this shows the level of risk under which we operate. Uh, for just for IATA crops, only from uh, Nigeria as a mandatory, we test for nearly 60 different pathogens. I would not go into too many details here. Uh, I just listed this uh, by crop. These are mandatory tests that we perform that includes both bacteria, virus, fungi, uh, nematodes, and insect pests. And we use a quite a range of methods from a very basic uh, agar blotter-based blotter test methods to the most sophisticated next generation sequencing. So on this process of international transfer, is monitored by the Gemplasm Health Unit, which serves as a gateway for international exchange of germplasm and other biological material. It is simply, in a simple terms, it can be called as a kind of internal quarantine. So any staff that wanted to move material, be it, be it import or export, has to pass through the, the GHU. GHU in turn will liaise with the National Plant Production Organization to make sure that we are in compliance with the phytosanitary regulation. So this starts with uh, obtaining the permits, necessary permits, be it import or phytosanitary permit for export, and then uh, testing to ascertain the health status of the material uh, in case of export or for post-entry inspection in case of the imports. And then ultimately we deliver material to the, the scientist or concerned partner within the center or you know, par partner organizations outside the center. There's a big team involved. I just showed the key people associated with this um, in this process. Uh, it's a very big team and they work almost, I would say, three, six, five days. It's a restless job. Um, in terms of our core functions, GHU serves as both service as well as research uh, unit. It performs surveillance of pest and pathogen in the germplasm as well as geographies. Uh, we develop diagnostics when necessary, or we adopt already available diagnostics for uh, seed health testing, and we standardize them and use for uh, health testing following the standard protocols. We develop phytosanitary procedures for pest elimination from the germplasm to generate virus-free material. We ensure compliance with the national and international regulations. We provide advocacy and raise awareness on phytosanitary issues and actively participate in capacity development of our partners as well as our own internal teams. Quality management is a very important uh, aspect. Three years ago, GHUs have started aligning with uh, what we call as a GHU minimum quality management system as a standard procedure. And that operates across all activities. And one, in, one important thing that I would like to stress is uh, GHU is not a single entity. We draw expertise from uh, multiple units within. Uh, that way we reduce the cost and improve the efficiency. For example, GHUs are not directly involved in the planting material production. This is done by the either genetic resource center or breeding programs. Um, we provide best protocols for producing pest-free planting material. And then we have seed processing unit that is that uh, performs 
seed fumigation to eliminate uh, pests. And then the virology unit, which provides virus diagnostic service to the GHUs. So GHU acts as a kind of uh, a liaison in drawing the, the capacities that are available within the center so that we benefit from the existing capacity instead of having standard and capacity for everything. And then the GHUs, in terms of the core activities, liaison with quarantine agencies, number one. We deal with NPPO, for example, in Nigeria, it is with Nigerian Agriculture Quarantine Service. We also serve as helpline and provide advocacy for our internal clients in terms of matters of uh, uh, seed health. And we maintain all the documentation and data management. Every material that is exchanged, transferred from uh, IATA is carefully documented here, both hard and soft copies, all the permits and everything. Workflow management is very, very critical because all the GHU exchange activities are time bound. So we have to make sure that the material is delivered to the end user on time. Otherwise, they may miss the season, seed may lose the viability. So there are, we are dealing with perishable material. So workflow management is extremely important. And then the seed health testing, which is directly handled by GHU itself. Um, we have protocols for both export and import. I would not go into details because this has been touched upon by previous presenters. These protocols always are in line with the host country requirements. So we align with the National Plant Production uh, Organization requirement where we are based. For example, if you are located in Nigeria, we align with the Nigerian uh, system. If you are operating from uh, uh, Kenya, we align with the KFIS system. So this is something which is uniform. When it comes to seed health testing, we use a range of methods. The first and foremost is the physical inspection during the active growth stage. Uh, we regenerate plants to observe for symptoms, also test seeds for any physical damage or infest infestations. So this is almost like a front line. And then seed and seedling tests looked for both fungi, bacteria, and viruses. Uh, there are a range of tests that are performed here. And we go up to selective media, use of selective media in case if you have to identify uh, pest, um, bacteria or fungi. Uh, we also perform confirmatory diagnostics. And our gold standard always is PCR, based methods or ELISA. There are a number of diagnostics available, but these are the standard methods we use for virus diagnostics when it comes to the germplasm health. And we also use a range of other methods for ascertaining the absence of uh, insects and nematodes. Um, we also do sequencing when necessary. And more recently, we are adopting uh, next generation sequencing methods, especially for virus indexing of uh, clonal crops. The Isothermal methods, these are like quick diagnostics such as LAMP and recombinase polymerase amplification are used very sparingly for virus indexing. We use that more often for surveillance in the fields. Um, so in terms of the protocol, since we deal with both clonal and uh, seed-based germplasm, we have separate uh, workflows. I just have shown one scheme here for cassava, a similar system we use for even for yam and uh, banana. So it all starts with establishing virus free planting material, following a complicated virus elimination procedures that include sometimes treatments such as thermotherapy, meristeming. We also use chemotherapy. And most often these are in vitro process. And then we index the material. Uh, from, from each individual, we generate at least 10 startup, uh, what we call as a primary clones. We index and uh, remove anything that is tested positive and then we go for the second line of indexing again. And only the material that test virus-free are further propagated to increase the numbers and these are then conserved in the gene banks. So that way the material that passes this scheme is conserved, they are already virus-free and then there, there is no need for further testing as long as uh, the isolation processes are maintained. And the similar way for uh, legume and maize germplasm, uh, we perform grower tests uh, inspect plants visually to eliminate any virus and symptomatic plants, perform virus indexing by ELISA. We look for nearly uh, 15 different viruses. And then only seed is harvested from virus-free planting material. And then these are conserved for distribution and further uses. So the processes are quite rigorous. And the viruses that we generally look for is those that are reported in the, the country of origin. We don't test for every virus that is reported. That would become very daunting and super expensive and almost impossible to perform that. Uh, just as an example here, uh, the material is in the field and then it goes through the thermotherapy and then sterilization process during in vitro uh, procedures, meristeming, 
and eventually the planting material is tested multiple times for virus index. This is a collaborative effort between uh, the genetic resource center breeders and the germplasm health unit. Ultimately, the virus-free planting material is exported with appropriate documents. Ultimately, it will be accompanied with a health statement issued by the GHU. This is not a, a an easy process. It's very expensive. At an average, we spend about uh, $275,000 on just for virus indexing alone. And there are separate costs involved for planting material production. So all these investments are made just to make sure that we don't distribute any uh, regulated quarantine pests when we move planting material from CG centers. Quite often we get asked like, how do we make a decision? Because there are so many methods, so many pathogens are present. Um, there are so many ways that we could diagnose. And when actually we decide a particular plant is healthy to move, and this is where we have a decision uh, tree. Uh, we use this tree to, uh, to classify the material suitability for distribution. So it's a very rigorous process. Uh, just to show some data, like um, we frequently uh, make sure that every time we test, we also look for uh, what we are intercepting to understand the, the changes in the pathogen landscape in the field uh, or in the glass of situations. Uh, this provides very valuable knowledge in terms of our preparation for phytosanitation or even augmenting our diagnostic methods. Um, the same uh, with maize um, and other crops. One thing that we have noticed is the gene bank, for example, regeneration often happens in a single location. So the pest situations are very uniform. Whereas the breeding materials, they generate material in multiple locations, depending on the agroecology in which they are grown, the pests are also different. So this again provides a kind of valuable knowledge by just observing this data and we generate a lot of useful information. That also very useful because we have long-term data that could be used even for understanding the impact of climate change on some of these pests and the pest profiles. Um, yeah, so we do all these things to ultimately eliminate infested material. This is just uh, the list of crops where how frequently we intercept infected material to eliminate. This is something which varies depending on the, the crop and the so for instance yam by far has highest uh, rejections. This is because uh, YAM has viruses and the protocols are not yet optimum to eliminate viral infections. Whereas the for some crops, the, the pathogens that are transmitted through seed is much less and therefore they are much less risk in terms of uh, moving the material across the borders. So in terms of accession tested, it varies. Um, annually, we test around 5,000 accessions and nearly 160,000 samples each year. And this material is exported to at an average 60 to 50 to 60 countries uh, annually. And this varies by different programs. So we have a, a quite a range of data in terms of what are the requirements and how these requirements differ from country to country on all that stuff. There are some recent advances. So we have been now using um, some new technologies to improve augment diagnostics, especially in terms of improving the speed because most often indexing process is very time consuming and also expensive. If we can have an alternative uh, that might speed up the process and also reduce the cost. One of the things that we are looking at is non-invasive diagnostics using uh, spectral imaging. Uh, one of the technology we are using is called Videometer, which we acquired recently and started standardizing it now. Uh, this is a very simple system. It has a multispectral camera. <clears throat> it, we can put seed under it and the image, it will be taken just in a, less than a second. And then this image can be up, uh, analyzed computationally using machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, this is a very complicated process because the protocols are not readily available for, especially for the, the crops we are working. And there are the protocols available for, for example, barley, which is being used in brewing industry uh, in, and also wheat for some particular pathogens, but not for our. So now what we are doing is we are actually standardizing the protocol so that we can train the computers to recognize uh, the damaged seed, infested seed, so that now we will have a protocol, then that protocol can become very easy and handy tool for ready diagnostics. Uh, here are some screenshots just to show how easy it is, regardless of how the material is. When we take the picture, the program can easily rearrange um, by size and it can identify the damage levels. Um, so, and also the, 
if the seed is infested, once we train this is infested seed, then the computer will identify, okay, this is an infested seed that can be even removed without further testing. So the other procedure that we are using, we have heard from uh, Sebastian uh, presentation is the uh, use of small RNA sequencing, especially for uh, uh, clonal crops, yam, cassava, and uh, banana plantain. Um, we have standardized it since two years now, we have been using this. We are now across CG, we are now trying to align a standard approach for clonal crop indexing. And this alignment is between SIP, uh, SIAT, uh, IIT, and Bioversity, so that we all use the same kind of protocol and so same decision matrix for classifying the health status based on the NGS results. Um, so this is a time consuming. This it provides valuable data, but it takes about a month um, to get the results, mainly because we have to export libraries for sequencing and that could take time. We have now standardized protocols for all our mandate crops. And in due course, we have all detected some new viruses that were not previously reported to occur in uh, our jam plasm. So many of these are not known to be pathogenic. We don't know the consequence of this. So this is something the work is in progress. And one thing we also realized is that there is often good correlation between the NGS results and uh, the gold standard methods such as RT-PCR, PCR for known viruses. And one of the ways we want to position this NGS-based diagnostics is, is to cut the time taken to ascertain the health of the plant. For example, if this is the scheme for testing YAM uh, health, which takes almost about 12 to 18 months. Now, the main reason for that is once the plant is established in vitro, we have to wait for the plant to go to a, a certain stage before we perform indexing for reliable virus detection. We are now looking at an option of shortcutting this by performing indexing at the in vitro stage and see whether this correlates with the growth test results. And we are getting reasonably good results. And if this succeeds, uh, this might dramatically cut time to ascertain um, yam and other clonal crop health. So another issue um, which was not touched upon when um, uh, Sebastian was talking about banana is uh, integrated viruses. Banana has some integrated viruses that cannot be eliminated. So how do we solve this problem? And this is where now we are using a regulatory approach. Um, we have established a decision matrix and we take prior consent before we export germplasm. We inform the importer about the integrated uh, viruses and we send material with a disclaimer. Now this is now being globally accepted procedure because there is no other way. Wherever you see banana with B genome, the BSV is integrated. And we are also learning that there are integrated um, non-activatable uh, endogenous uh, badna viruses also occurring in yams. Uh, they don't have any pathogenic significance, at least at this stage. Uh, another important thing that we always focus is that there are new ways of, uh, the, the, there are new methods by which the planting material are being now produced, and this can be exchange, distributed internationally. One of these methods, for example, is called SAH plants for yam and cassava. This is distribution of such kind of planting material is not part of the standard um, descriptions. Therefore, we need to develop protocols. So now we are looking at the risk assessment and uh, establishing standard, pro standard procedures so that uh, the planting material that are produced in boxes using SH can be conveniently transferred uh, to other countries. Uh, the last part of my talk is on the green pass. I won't go too, into too many details in the interest of time. Uh, just as a comparison, if anybody traveled to US in the customs before you pass through security, there is something called TSA Pre. This is basically a, a system where a passengers who are pre-registered with the, the border security and those who qualify, they don't have to go through rigorous testing. They can pass through. What we are now looking at is a similar kind of procedure for CG gemplasm. As you have seen in the last three days, the rigor with which the gemplasm is tested and the internal controls and voluntary decision making to say no for infested material. Now we are trying to translate this into a kind of a CGR green process protocol and get accreditation from the, the plant production organizations and the regulatory agencies. And any material that has been pre-certified as pest free that can be readily dis distributed without further uh, uh, retesting requirements. And this is something that now we are also trying to align with the ESAT e pro program of IPPC. So this is a work in progress and we are very optimistic that uh, it will probably will ease uh, the material transfer requirements. I mean, the ease the germplasm transfer between the borders. So the last slide I have is there are challenges despite excellent progress. 
there are some challenges for example slow turnaround is a challenge for clonal crops emerging diseases and pests every time a new disease is recognized we have to augment all our protocols and there is always a risk of known knowns and known unknowns you know there are so many pathogens that are present uh, when we can know that certain, certain pest is already present in our back backyard so this this is a kind of something which we always have to keep looking on our shoulders and then other problem is ad hoc interpretation of regulations by the, the quarantine agencies so this is sometimes a complication uh, there is a lack of updated pest list for many cgr crops which again uh, makes sometimes it delays getting permits and the demand for fast turnaround both from our internal clients as well as external clients so with which um, i will conclude my talk by showing the both the naqs team and the iata ghu team who work very close closely in ensuring the distributions from cgr so with that i conclude my talk um, we would not take any questions uh, at this stage we probably would take at the end um, without much delay i would invite uh, the next speaker uh, is mr obaje john um, who is the director for plant quarantine niger agriculture quarantine services um, he would like uh, i would request him to talk about uh, the experience of quarantine agency with iit i will share his presentation from my computer um if that is okay yeah you can talk we share from his computer okay from which now hello yes i'm i'm hello, sharing um, your presentation okay yeah please go ahead i i hope you can see the screen Yeah, I can see the screen. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Doctor. Can we? Okay. Uh, thank you, Doctor. You have the uh, the have it on your screen. And I think I can proceed. Yeah. Yeah, you can uh, see. Nigeria, I can proceed. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Proceed. Um, all right. Uh, Nigeria, this is a form of introduction to this presentation, short one. Nigeria Agricultural Quarantine Service, the National Plant Protection Organization for Nigeria, is a unit of the Federal Department of Agriculture, and they decided, government decided to merge the three units: plant health, animal health, and fishery as a regulatory agency. Each of the three main biological departments. plant animal and the fishery are headed by directors and all the directors are headed by the director general nigeria agricultural quarantine service it the member of siga center has been our mission to emplazing exchange and this diagnostic the room partners okay. go ahead okay is it don't control it yeah can i go ahead yeah yeah go ahead Hello. Hello. Okay. Um Okay there seems to be some connection issue um we will wait I will ask our IT team to check if uh, Obaja is online Oh I think there is a, a problem with this uh, 
connection. All right, so are there any questions in the meantime? Or we'll, we'll go to the last presenter. Uh, maybe I will invite uh, Michael Abutton to give his remarks. Okay, I'm coming. Can you hear me? Yes, Michael. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, we will, yeah. Uh, just, just, just before you go, Michael, we yeah. will wait for uh, Mr. Robajay to come online. If he managed to come online, we will continue with the presentation later. But uh, I let Michael Abutton to give his remarks. Uh, uh, to reintroduce, Dr. Michael Abutton is the head of Genetic Resource Center. He's also the deputy director for West Africa Hub. And he's a focal point for excellence in breeding project, which is a CGR initiative. Go ahead, Michael. Okay, thank you. Well, my remarks will be very brief uh, as a sort of concluding message. I want to congratulate yourself, Lava, and um, all those involved with today and actually the week of phytosanitary awareness within the International Year of Plant Health. Um, we've heard a lot of very good and useful information today. And I think that's my first point. We always have to really work at trying to maintain this level of awareness and to increase the awareness. Everybody who's on this call today will appreciate the importance of the work that the Germplasm Health Unit is doing. But that doesn't mean to say that everybody, even within, for example, the CGIAR or or research centers or in institutes or universities around the world really appreciate that. So we always have to keep making those points and really trying to support that work wherever we can and look for opportunities also to support it financially because it really is crucial, obviously, to many other uh, research and breeding work that, that goes on. But it doesn't always get the attention that it deserves. Uh, my second point is also that I think we've heard quite a bit today about the importance of new technologies, whether they be sequencing or um, different technologies with respect to image analysis. And that's also important. It's important that we really latch onto these and where we can translate those in and implement them properly in our work because they are going to be the way forward in terms of the efficiency, the speed with which we um, should be able to do things. So just a few more points and then we can go back to the presenter. I just also want to make the point that, you know, these policy issues uh, that we hear about are also important. And we also need to be aware of those. It's not only about the technical issues. It's not only about, um, you know, applying new technologies, but also policy, that policy framework. And we really need to be strongly engaged there because that is also has a major influence on the work that we can do. We know there's a political side to it, but there's also a side where we need to bring the evidence to inform policy. It's very important. And uh, in terms of looking at things from a gene bank's perspective, obviously, the gene banks and the germplasm health unit, for example, in IITA, work very closely together. And I think around the world, really, there's a very strong interaction between um, germplasm health and the gene banks. But it's also important to recognize that the work of the germplasm health goes well beyond that, including the breeding programs and every other uh, form of transfer from centers. And finally, I want to mention the question of capacity development, how we can network, how we can collaborate, how we can produce really a system, if you like, of germplasm health units, which are more effective and more efficient. We all have to work 
together. Um, CG centers, national programs, MPPOs, uh, all other institutions which are involved, maybe on the technical side, maybe on the, on the phytosanitary policy side, we need to work together to develop a stronger system. You know, we know that a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. So we have to have a strong chain if we're really going to be able to move forward and to maintain the phytosanitary safety for all the germplasm transfers that we need. So thank you. So Lava, uh, that's it from me. So I think we can go back to the speaker. Lava, did you get that? Can we? Are you hearing me? Yeah, thank you, Michael. I was unmuted by the. Uh... <laughs> IT guys, so I can't speak. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks Sorry. a lot for these recommendations. Excellent okay. point. Okay, all right. Um, Thank you. I appreciate. I know you have been very tight schedule, and thanks for overstaying. Uh, I would now invite uh, Wobajay John, who is now back, to finish off his uh, talk. Uh, can you s see my screen? You you see the screen? No, the screen is not here yet. The screen is not focused yet. Okay, now you can see my screen, right? I see, yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. The objective of the agency is to prevent the entry, introduction, and spread of transboundary pests into Nigeria and also to prevent the export of the pests existing in Nigeria to other countries. Okay. Prominent among this, yeah, prominent among these uh, benefits in the area of capacity building and provision of scientific equipment are uh, enumerated below. Human capacity development, training, and prevention of equipment. In collaboration with ITA, NPPO Nigeria and APS have benefited a lot from this uh, uh, capacity development with our partners and uh, uh, inspectors. The use of video meter application for non invasive seat head diagnosis head at Ibado is part of the training IITA has been providing for PPO. We have also uh, had workshops on banana bumpy top diagnostics and surveillance. Four army one uh, meeting at the uh, AU. The four army one was uh, detected in Nigeria in 2016 in collaboration with RITA, where the press was read. In collaboration with the hosting of the TCRPPO. In 2019, in October, precisely, the IITA collaborated with National Plant Protection Organization of Nigeria to successfully host the 31st technical consultation among regional plant protection organizations. And this meeting was widely acclaimed successful by the IPP secretariat as well as the African uh, Union. Follow me one biocontrol training at IIT at ITA in Kutnu, annual retreat between NAQS and ITA Ibadan. BBTV eradication work in collaboration with ITA and NIHOT at Idu Logun. Workshop on strategic planning to prevent M. Mesletal necrotic disease at ITA Ibadan. Workshop on tackling invasive species in Africa, ACP and Nairobi. Provision of cassava surveillance system for early detection of cassava brown street disease pests 
and diseases at NAQS post entry diagnostic station in Bado, Oyo State, Nigeria. The provision of solar power battery inverter for mycotoxin and pesticide residue laboratory at NAQS post entry diagnostic stations. Provision of two 3.5 kVA generating sets for import and export laboratory analysis of consignments. All of these are way IITA has been collaborating, collaborating with uh, NAQS in the phytosanitary administration. Two sets of typewriters at Badon NAQS post entry station for import export office. Working with IIT on management of fruit fly, Bacteria dosalis, banana monkey top eradication work since 2013 at the Logo State, as I've said. Awareness or advocacy on management of papaya millibug, tuta absoluta, and other pests on root and tuber crops. Information exchange to support pest listing, reporting, and PRA. Collaborations in analysis of plants and plant products samples for pest identification. Also, during the launching on the 13th of, uh, of September 2018, IT supported Nigeria in the launching of the Tandoya plant head. We also have the collaboration in moving issuing of uh, fertility certificates for consignments going out of Nigeria and also clearance of import permits for consignments coming into Nigeria. In the areas of uh, surveillance, our officers have been trained just as he himself has displayed the pictures of NAQS uh, inspectors in the previous uh, presentation he has made. The presence of RTA in Nigeria has benefited both the local farmers group of farmers that are big enough for other markets and has export, I mean, enhanced export and import of agro commodities from Nigeria. And the presence of the IIT is beneficial to the country, the NPPO, and for training and for manpower development, especially as a research institute. We want to be grateful to IIT for all that they have done because the partnership, the partnership and the collaboration with IIT the center cannot be underestimated, and therefore we also move forward for improving our partnership to save for a safe agricultural economy of the country. And we want to thank you for all of this. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Mr. Obaje, for excellent uh, summarization of uh, the various joint activities that were done by NQS and. Uh, CG centers that are located here, particularly IATA. I would also now invite you to give your uh, the closing remarks. This is the last part of our workshop. And then if uh, people are interested, we'll keep it open for 10 more minutes for any um, clarifications. I still see the presenters are available online. If anybody have questions, um, you can keep typing them in the chat or you can pose after the closing remarks by Dr. John Obache. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Just uh, on behalf of the Honorable Minister of Federal Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development of Nigeria, which is the host uh, country for IITA in Nigeria and Africa. What are you talking about? Okay, thank you. Also, on behalf of uh, the Director, I have. Dr. Gerard and the DG, Director General of Nigeria Agricultural Health Service, I hereby offer my sincere commendation to the organizers for providing this excellent platform for the exchange of information on plant health and gemplasm movements around the world and other collaborative agencies that have played different roles and services to maintain plant health regulation and safety such as germplasm health units, seed health units, and gene banks. I thank the organizers for giving NAQS, that Nigeria Agricultural Control Service, 
this opportunity to make these closing remarks. This event has created a huge awareness on the contributions of GHUs on agricultural development and the economies of countries and continents. Phytosanitary procedures in the movements of germplasms, intricacies, and associated health risks and safeguards. Next slide. Okay, yeah. The four day meeting of experts on the participatory action and principles involved in the movement of critical planting materials through collaboration between government regulatory organizations and research institutes around the world is very apt. It provides huge contribution to the observance of international plant health. This phytosanitary awareness initiative has given us adequate information on the structure, functions, and achievements of plant health services in each regions of the world. This program brings into focus the immense responsibility resting on NPPOs in inspecting and satisfying plants for planting and the need to establish an enduring working relationship with the germplasm health units of the SIGA International Research Institute. For example, the collaboration between NAPS and ITA is legendary. The two organizations have ensured the safe reception and ex export of thousands of planting materials by following strict phytosanitary procedures, joint programs on fruit flies, vulnerable top virus disease and follow me one have been successfully executed. The presence of RTA, a member of SIGA, has contributed a lot to plant health management and the distribution of safe germplasm exchange within the African region. Next slide. You see me. Yes, this global meeting is unique. It has brought together the frontline players of plant pest regulators and handlers of germplasm, which provide vehicles for the movement of the pests associated with plant materials. Therefore, this intervention has enabled us to know our colleagues worldwide and their different responsibilities. Different methods and techniques of pest diagnosis, diagnostics and current tools used in pest diagnosis were also presented. In conclusion, this meeting has been an eye-opener as to the activities being carried out in each region of the world. I sincerely do appreciate the scientific contributions by all the partner participants. We hope that this unique phytosanitary awareness initiative is maintained. I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk here. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Obajay, for this nice conclusions. Um, you said it well, and your appreciation for all the speakers today and then the previous sessions and the effort they put in to bring out all the knowledge and the methods and procedures they have been using in different parts of the world from for distributing uh, planting material is really commendable. And I appreciate all the speakers today from my behalf as well. And uh, I inform all the participants that tomorrow is the concluding session. We start as usual at uh, 1 p.m. Nigeria time and uh, session is for two hours. The first 30 minutes, we present uh, key issues and recommendations coming from each of the session, Asia, Latin America and Africa, followed by a panel, expert panel, which will be moderated by Mr. Mirako from IPPC uh, to address some of the matters arising. And that would, and also take questions from the participants. We keep uh, microphones open. Um, and then we conclude with a kind of a key recommendations and way forward action. Uh, we hope to start on time and conclude 
on time tomorrow. So you're all welcome. And uh, we will keep this session open for another 15 minutes if somebody have any question or clarification from the speakers who are still online. So I once again, thank you for your participation and apologies for extended uh, session today. Um, but otherwise, it was great. I mean, we touched upon very important topics and very important crops um, and important issues pertinent to Africa and other parts of the world. Thank you very much.